All right. Thank you, Russell. And I want to thank you and Emily for allowing me the opportunity to, to speak this morning to this group. Um, we are trying to get the message out about um, New York State's planned implementation of the New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, which you will hear me refer to as the CLCPA or the Climate Act. Um, but before I get into the details uh, of, of the law and, and our implementation, I do want to just take a moment to remind us all uh, if we needed to understand why New York State has embarked on this journey, uh, which is to achieve a net zero economy. And we, to do that, we have to start with the global context and understanding that a dangerous gap exists between our international ambition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the level of reductions that are necessary to avoid dangerous warming, dangerous to people, dangerous to the ecosystems that we all care about. The nations of the world have agreed in principle to limit warming to less than one and a half degrees centigrade. We are already at one or 1.1 degrees centigrade. Um, but uh, again, that agreement is an attempt to try an attempt to avoid triggering of positive feedback loops that could lead to levels of warming from which the globe and the ecosystems in which all of us depend could never recover. But we have already baked into our Earth system a significant amount of climate change, and current policies and targets at the international and national level will allow warming to exceed not only one and a half degrees centigrade, but probably two. In fact, current national policies, even if fully enacted would likely allow 2.7 degrees centigrade warming by the end of this century and possibly as much as 3.6 degrees centigrade. At that level of warming, uh, substantial portions of the earth would not be inhabitable by humans. It's important for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the long-term benefit of our children and grandchildren, but it's also important to recognize that we will be dealing, and we all, all are already dealing with substantial climatic change and its effects, regardless of what we do now to reduce emissions. Therefore, as we make investments to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we must simultaneously prepare for the effects of climate change. We have already delayed meaningful action too long, and the longer we procrastinate, the more we will feel the effects of a rapidly warming climate and the more expensive the more draconian and the more likely to fail the necessary greenhouse gas mitigation measures will have to be. New York State enacted the CLCPA in 2019, and it went into effect on January 1st of 2020. So even though we are um, developing um, the draft scoping plan uh, for, to implement certain portions of the law, other portions went into effect on, um, in, in, again, January 1st, 2020. Overall, the statute sets achievement of a net zero economy by 2050 as a goal, requiring an 85% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions while allowing for the sequestration of up to about 15% of our emissions. And all these percentages are based on a 1990 baseline. The statute sets an interim greenhouse gas emission limit of no more than 60% of 1990 levels. That is a 40% reduction by 2030. And it requires DEC to promulgate a regulation that actually sets those 60% and 15% emissions limit, which we have done. Although the Climate Act does not detail an emissions reduction plan it does envision an overall strategy of beneficial electrification of the entire New York State economy, empowering that efficient electrified economy with clean sources of power, including 70% renewable electricity by 2030, 100% uh, zero carbon electricity by 2040. And I'll want to emphasize that um, these requirements apply to all electricity sold in New York State, whether it is generated out of the state or inside the state. The law also requires large investments in storage, long-term um, storage to balance the intermittency that is inherent to wind, water, and solar power. In support of this strategy, the law requires the Public Service Commission to undertake proceedings to ensure large investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency. These proceedings are underway, and you have, uh, have likely seen announcements of, for instance, large offshore wind installations, etc. The law requires that investments in disadvantaged communities be prioritized and that support be provided to individuals and communities currently dependent on fossil fuel 
coal industries as they uh, re make the transition uh, into a, this clean energy economy. The statute charges DEC as the primary with the primary regulatory role in limiting greenhouse gas emissions, but other agencies may also issue regulations uh, in support of uh, achieving the uh, emission reduction requirements, uh, uh, and they can do so with this statute as authority. Agency regulations are to be guided by a scoping plan to be developed in turn by the Climate Action Council. The scoping plan must also be reflected in the first state energy plan issued after completion of the scoping plan. And this is important to understand that more the operational detail of implementing the, the, um, uh, the scoping plan would um, be uh, laid out in the state energy plan, uh, which I believe is due in 2025. The council comprises 22, the Climate Action Council comprises 22 appointees with the president and CEO of NYSERDA, currently Doreen Harris, uh, and uh, DEC Commissioner Basil Sago serving as the co-chairs. Pursuant to the statute, the council appointed seven advisory panels to make recommendations for greenhouse gas reductions in each of seven major emission sectors. Um, uh, I happen to have been appointed uh, to the Land Use and Local Government Advisory Panel, but I will note that um, most of the membership of these advisory panels was not by any means uh, state agency staff. They were for the most part representatives of industry, um, the power sector, um, um, uh, NGO um, representatives, academics, and other experts. The council also asked the land use and local government advisory panel to develop adaptation and resilience recommendations, even though the statute does not require these kinds of recommendations to be included. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. All, rec all the recommendations that have been approved by the council are now embodied in a draft scoping plan, which the council released for public comment on December 30th, 2021. Just want to point out an, uh, a couple aspects of the law um, that are often misunderstood. And in fact, an often overlooked but very important part of the CLCPA is its Section 7. And Section 7 requires all state agencies to reduce their operational emissions, um, sort of the leadership by example um, um, thing that we do. Um, but more significantly, Section 7 requires that all state agencies, not just DEC, um, consider any action, in considering any action, issuance of a license, a permit, uh, a policy, uh, major investments, um, those all the all state agencies must determine the consistency of that decision with the greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements. Uh, we are still working on guidance uh, on how to actually implement that, uh, but DEC has already used this requirement as the basis for denying two permits, as many of you are probably aware, um, to repower existing power plants, specifically the Dan Scammer power plant and the Astoria power plant. These these denials are now the subject of appeals in court, and we'll have to wait and see how those appeals play out. Um, but those are examples where DEC has used um, this authority uh, and actually the requirement that DEC uh, review uh, uh, applications for their for permits for consistency with um, the requirement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I'll also note that although public focus has been largely on the greenhouse gas reduction requirements of the Climate Act, CLCPA Section 9 made significant amendments to the Community Risk and Resiliency Act for 2014. And you undoubtedly recall that I made a presentation on CARA uh, to this group um, probably seven or eight years ago. Um, without going into much of the detail, I'll note that as amended, the Community Risk and Resiliency Act now requires consideration of all climate change effects, not just sea level rise, storm surge, and flooding, which uh, was the language in the original law, but um, now requires consideration of all climate change effects during re a review of applications for all major permits and almost all of DEC's regulatory programs, not just the select few that were um, included in uh, the original um, 
Community Risk and Resiliency Act. So the scope of review uh, pursuant to the Community Risk and Resiliency Act um, was uh, greatly expanded by <clears throat> the amendments uh, and put in place by passage of the CLCPA. Further, these amendments, uh, for the first time, give DEC specific or explicit authority to require mitigation of significant climate risk to virtually any asset not owned by the applicant during uh, its uh, permit review uh, um, process. So where are we now? As I mentioned, the, the law took effect on January 1st of 2020, and we did have a slow start um, due to COVID. Uh, the executive chamber was obviously focused on response to the pandemic, uh, and we did not get appointments to the uh, Climate Action Council and the advisory panels made as fast as we otherwise would have. Um, but we still have the original statutory deadlines to meet, and I'll, I'll describe those in a moment. Uh, but we have not been given any dispensation. When I say we, I mean the staff and the advisory panels and the council have not been given any dispensation by the governor, the legislature, or other leadership to miss any of the deadlines that are laid out in the law. The council first met in March of 2020, and later that year, the advisory panels began development of their recommendations, including extensive public consultation. Um, all of the advisory panel meetings, as well as the council meetings, were open to the public in that they could be viewed. Um, many of the advisory panels included opportunities to um, receive stakeholder input, uh, either as part of their regular meetings or as part of um, specific events, the land use and local government advisory panel, on which I sat, held um, two roundtables specifically with um, local elected officials to, uh, again, um, to receive input on the recommendations as we develop them. The, the advisory panels presented their recommendations to the council during the spring and early summer of 2021, and agency staff from, from a number of agencies, but particularly DEC, NYSERDA, and the Department of Public Service, began preparing the draft scoping plan as consensus formed on the council around the recommendations that would be included in the draft plan. The council released the draft scoping plan on December 30th of 2021, and a public comment period commenced on January 1st of 2022. The final scoping plan is due before January 1st, 2023, that is by the end of this year. And DEC is required to promulgate implementing regulations to achieve the required emission reductions just one year later. DEC's regulations are to be guided by the scoping plan. In parallel to the council process, and in addition to supporting the council and the various advisory panels, state agency staff have completed several other required milestones, including the Public Service Commission's adoption of the new 70 by 30 clean energy standard. DEC and NYSERDA have issued a report on the barriers to clean energy and adaptation resources and opportunities to overcome those barriers in disadvantaged communities, as again, as required by the law. Whoops. And DEC has also finalized and released guidance on the use of the social cost of carbon in agency decision making. We've released the required regulations setting those 2030 and 2050 um, greenhouse gas emission limits. And we have set a, uh, established a regulation limiting end uses of certain hydrofluorocarbons. And as required by the Climate Act, DEC issued a greenhouse gas emissions report at the end of 2021. Based on this report, we can see the enormity of the challenge as we as New Yorkers face, um, and as illustrated by that bar graph on the right, reducing the state's greenhouse gas emissions from about 375 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent in 2019 to about 61 million metric tons over the next 30 years. Um, we show this, the circular graph, which indicates the relative proportions um, represented by our major emission sectors, and then the outer ring of that circular graph shows the contribution of certain sources within each of those sectors. And understanding the current sources of our emissions can help us understand the selection of strategies uh, to be included in the draft scoping plan. 
I want to note that all the many people tend to think of power plants as the major cause of climate change. They represent only about 13% of New York State's total greenhouse gas emissions. New York State has what is probably the cleanest grid in electrical grid um, in the nation, and we are working to make it cleaner. However, in New York State, the transportation sector at 28% and our buildings at 32% represent much larger sources of, um, of emissions. Of course, the transportation sector um, is, are, is the emissions associated with cars, trains, and airplanes, and so forth. Building emissions are primarily the result of combustion of fossil fuels to heat space and water and for use in cooking and drying clothing. Um, waste management, which includes methane emissions from landfills and wastewater treatment plants, comes in at about 12%, um, again, almost as much as uh, uh, as uh, power generation in New York State. Um, agriculture in New York State is important, but relatively small um, uh, at about 6%. Oops. The council's planning has been informed by analysis performed by NYSERDA and its consultants to integrate all the advisory panel recommendations to assess their likely total effects on greenhouse gas emissions, as well as costs and benefits. This analysis included a reference case based on business as usual, plus all the greenhouse gas reduction policies New York State already has in place. And that was used to produce scenario one. I'm sorry, uh, that was the, the um, uh, base case. Scenario one included all the recommendations as presented by the advisory panel. So remember, we have seven advisory panels making recommendations uh, uh, for sector specific uh, reductions of greenhouse gases. Those, greenhouse, those recommendations relayed then to the council um, and analyzed by NYSERDA and its consulting services. Um, when we put all of those um, recommendations into the models that were being used, uh, again, under scenario one, we found that um, all the panel recommendations put together were not sufficient to achieve the required emission reductions, um, which is why we don't even show scenario one here. And it's also why we don't, you don't hear us talking much about what would be prioritized because the fact is we don't have a lot of room to, to uh, pick and choose priority strategies because we need to do virtually everything uh, humanly possible because again, we have waited so long and need to make um, uh, emission reductions uh, so fast. Um, to its credit, the council um, being presented with the fact that all the recommendations would not achieve the required emission reductions, um, the council went back to the drawing board and developed the three action scenarios described here, that is scenarios two, th uh, two three, and four. Um, all of these scenarios would be expected to achieve the required reductions. Um, all these scenarios include um, certain foundational strategies in the power generation, transportation, agriculture, and waste sectors, and all have a heavy emphasis on rapid electrification and gains in energy efficiency that must be included if we are to achieve the required emission reductions. The three scenarios differ, however, in the degree to which they um, provide for different approaches um, to reduce emissions from some fairly minor sources. In general, the three action scenarios differ somewhat in their use of low carbon fuels derived from biomass and green hydrogen versus an, versus an accelerated transition away from all combustion or in the pace with which some policies are implemented, uh, particularly those policies that are intended to drive reduction of vehicle miles traveled and to reduce methane emissions. The draft scoping plan and supporting documents uh, at climate.ny.gov describe these greenhouse gas reduction strategies in detail, and I will just provide a very high level summary um, uh, of the strategies common to all three scenarios here. 
All, strat all um, scenarios include deep improvements in energy efficiency across all sectors, but particularly in our buildings, which remember are our largest source of emissions, where more than half of New York State's 6 million buildings will require improvements uh, in their shell, the windows, the insulation, the roof, um, to improve their energy efficiency. But while this will require investment, it will also ultimately reduce energy bills, improve comfort, and provide passive resistance to power outages. The draft scoping plan um, calls for eventual electrification of heating of water and space, primarily through use of high efficiency heat pumps and the elimination of gas for cooking and drying clothes, first in new buildings and eventually in existing buildings with a phase out of gas home appliances by 2035. This does not mean that someone is going to come around to your home and confiscate your gas stove or your gas dryer, but it will be eventually um, uh, you will not be able to replace um, gas and oil appliances um, with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with new fossil fuel uh, appliances um, as we come into the middle of the next decade. To help achieve climate justice and to conserve land, the plan calls for enhanced mass transit, true smart growth, and other strategies to reduce vehicle miles traveled in passenger cars and trucks. All three scenarios include electrification of light duty vehicles. And as you probably have already learned, the governor has already signed legislation um, getting ahead of this um, recommendation. That legislation would ban the sale of gas and diesel powered cars and light duty trucks by 2035. Of course, the plan recognizes that our newly electrified economy must be powered by zero emissions electricity. It includes strategies to eliminate high global warming potential refrigerants, as well as fugitive methane emissions across the waste, agriculture, and energy sectors, while maximizing carbon sequestration in our lands and forests uh, through land conservation and improved soil and forest management. Low carbon fuels such as biomass or green hydrogen will likely be necessary in hard to electrify sectors such as aviation, heavy duty vehicles, or high temperature industrial processes. With regard to total electricity demand, as we replace our fossil fuel heating systems with heat pumps, our electrical power demand will, like, will transition from a summer peaking system to a winter peaking system. Bioenergy or green hydrogen, in addition to battery storage, will likely be necessary to ensure grid reliability, which is a fundamental aspect of the planning, um, but we will need these uh, resources to ensure grid reliability as electrical consumption doubles over time. The Climate Act allows us to count sequestration of the equivalent of up to 15% of our 1990 emissions toward achievement of that net zero goal. However, achieving this level of additional sequestration will be difficult because New York State has already um, is already so forested. So we may be required to reduce emissions by more than 85% of their 1990 levels um, or to rely on technology such as carbon capture and sequestration to achieve that net zero goal. Of course, there will be costs, but also benefits, and NYSERDA has compared the anticipated costs of the three action scenarios with the benefits and job creation opportunities of each. When accounting for both the economic impacts of climate change using DEC social cost of carbon guidance and monetized health benefits, NYSERDA estimates that investments of a relatively small proportion of the state's gross state product would yield net benefits of 90 to $120 billion between now and 2050. A large portion of those net benefits will be in the form of public health across all action scenarios. As we reduce combustion of fossil fuels to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we eliminate our largest source of other pollutants that cause and exacerbate a variety of cardiorespiratory illnesses, particularly among the elderly, children, the urban poor, and outside workers. We also anticipate health benefits associated with efforts to encourage non-motorized transportation, that is more, wike, more biking and walking. And I'll also note for this group that as we decrease fossil fossil fuel combustion, uh, significant sources of water pollution will also um, go away. 
The draft scoping plan includes strategies to reduce emissions from six major emission sectors, transportation, buildings, power generation, industry, agriculture, and forestry, and waste, and recommended cross-sector policies for land use, local government, uh, clean energy and adaptation and resilience. Now, neither time nor your patience will allow me to review all these strategies and policies, and certainly I couldn't do that in any meaningful way. Um, I will, however, spend the next few minutes discussing a few major strategic themes that I think are would be of interest to this group. Achieving enough additional carbon, soil, and force sequestration to offset 15% of our emissions, as I said, will be difficult. But the draft plan does include numerous regulatory and investment strategies to maximize what we can achieve, including development of a statewide conservation framework, protection of forest land, including avoiding conversion of forest land, and achieving a balance between the need to develop utility scale renewables while protecting important habitats. And the plan calls for improved wetlands protection, which um, I think we are happy to, to say the legislature and the governor have already adopted in the, uh, as part of the recent budget. Um, and the plan includes strategies to encourage and support local and private forest and soil stewardship. Smart growth is central to strategies to reduce vehicle miles traveled and their associated transportation emissions, and many of the draft scoping plans land use strategies are focused on strengthening the role of regional and county based land use planning to guide, inform and incentivize smart, equitable, sustainable land use decisions at the municipal level. The draft plan recognizes that some carbon mitigation strategies also have adaptation value, um, and you will find them in the mitigation strategies for some of uh, these sectors. For example, the agriculture and forestry strategies um, to uh, increase adoption of agroforestry include a call to increase riparian buffers and to promote establishment of forested buffers through continuation and expansion of the state's agricultural non-point source source water buffer and trees for TRIB programs. In addition to the greenhouse gas mitigation strategies, the scoping plan includes recommendations related to adaptation and resilience. Um, this, these, plan, these recommendations do not comprise a, um, a, a complete climate adaptation plan, um, but they do are, we um, have generated about 60 adaptation and resilience recommendations and grouped them in 12 initiatives organized under these three broad themes. I wanna note that these recommendations are not binding on any entity. They're not binding on the governor, the legislature or any, any agency, but we do think they are for the most part, good ideas and we are, um, uh, hopeful that they will be picked up by the relevant actors and of course and I will mention a few that um, are already being implemented. The building capacity theme comprises four initiatives related to statewide planning, consideration of future conditions in state decision making, and enhancement of our general understanding of climate change with improvement in the public's adaptive capacity. Chief among the land use and local government advisory panels adaptation recommendations within this theme are that the governor appoint a chief state resilience officer to ensure coordination of all state programs related to climate adaptation and resilience and direct to direct that officer to develop finally a comprehensive state adaptation um, and resilience plan. The panel has developed five initiatives to assist municipalities to prepare for and react to the increasingly severe climate hazards, which, um, which is something the panel believes is uh, among the most important things the state could do. These initiatives include recommendations to expand state support for regional and local planning and to assist municipalities in their efforts to incorporate future conditions into planning, uh, local planning and regulatory decisions. The panel also makes specific recommendations to address risk due to flooding and extreme heat and to ensure resilience of the energy um, system. And I can look, we'll look at a, one or two of those recommendations um, in detail. Um, we local officials uh, can consistently advise that they lack resources, including not only funds, but technical expertise and access to information and decision support tools. Um, so the state should accelerate current efforts to provide such guidance and financial 
support, uh, again, for community and regional planning, and for mainstreaming climate change considerations into local planning um, uh, <clears throat> and regulatory programs. Um, I'm going to go through these uh, pretty quickly. Um, again, we want to work to mainstream consideration of climate change in environmental review. Um, um, and some of that work is ongoing, but we have a lot more to do to uh, implement uh, climate change considerations into SEEKER. Um, flooding, of course, is New York's primary um, climate hazard, uh, and we can expect both insured and uninsured losses to increase as sea level continues to rise and more frequent extreme precipitation events result in more extensive and deeper floods. Um, uh, there are specific recommendations related to the state building code, um, uh, right sizing um, uh, infrastructure, including um, stream crossing, uh, transportation stream crossing. Um, developing a statewide mapping strategy, uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, our office is working with the Division of Water um, to try to get some funding and other resources to actually begin to implement many of these recommendations now, and perhaps you'd like to hear about those uh, if we're able to get those off the ground. There are specific recommendations for extreme heat, and in fact, the governor has already taken up this recommendation um, in her state of the state message. She directed DEC and NYSERDA to develop an extreme heat action plan, which we have already started working on. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to move through these. Uh, we certainly need to recognize uh, the need to ensure the reliability of our um, electric energy system, and there are specific recommendations rela related to that. And the um, living systems th theme is focused on protection of our ecosystems and biodiversity, um, our agriculture sector, and our forest protection sector, or forest uh, forestry sector. Uh, I'll just mention um, what we call AR-10 for Adaptation and Resilience Recommendation 10. Uh, and this in particular reflects the realization that reducing non-climatic stresses on our natural systems is one of the most effective things we can do to help those systems adapt to climate change. The components of this uh, strategy provide for a variety of mechanisms to ensure conservation or protection of the most important pieces of our life sustaining ecosystems, uh, including a focus on intentional planning to identify and protect critical ecosystems and to establish and protect connectivity at several scales, ranging from the landscape scale to enable populations to migrate northward and upward as the climate warms to project-specific planning to ensure wildlife and aquatic organism connectivity. Although the, and now stepping back to the scoping plan uh, in general. Um, although the council has released its draft scoping plan, it does have more work to do. It will continue to meet through the summer and fall. Uh, in addition to considering the public comment, it is going to be receiving, is receiving through the public comment period. Um, upcoming council meetings will include additional discussion of several critical topics, including potential use or abandonment of our current gas infrastructure, um, the degree to which we will continue to rely on combustion uh, uh, of gas, whether it be um, renewable natural gas, uh, renewable gas or natural gas, fossil natural gas, uh, they will also have to figure out how to pay for all this. The advisory panels were directed um, to develop um, necessary strategies, um, but not to be concerned about how they would be paid for. Um, there are estimates for the total cost, um, but uh, included in the modeling, um, but that modeling does is agnostic in terms of who pays for it and how, and that will be those will be policies that the council will have to develop. Um, as I begin to wrap up, let me encourage you to re review the entire draft scoping plan if you are of a mind or any of its sector-specific chapters at climate.ny.gov and to provide your input through June 10th. You can submit written comment through an online form at climateny.gov or you can submit via email to scopingplan at nicerta.gov. The council um, uh, has scheduled eight in-person uh, public hearings. These are formal hearings and two virtual hearings. Uh, if uh, We will be holding the, the fourth um, hearing today in Albany. Um, 
the recordings of prior hearings are now available um, at climate.ny.gov. Um, there is additional information uh, at that website uh, on the um, uh, venues, the address, addresses of the venues for the upcoming um, um, upcoming hearings you are you and there will be links to allow real time viewing of the in person hearings however those um, it, if you want to make a comment at an in person hearing you must attend in person uh, you can make uh, comments uh, remotely through either one of the two virtual hearings that have been scheduled and of course anyone can provide written comment uh, using the instructions at climate.ny.gov if you do decide to go make a statement at one of the um, in person hearings or at any of the virtual hearings hearings understand that um, speakers are going to be limited to two minutes um, you are encouraged to pre-register for the hearings as priority for seating uh, in the hearing and uh, order of speaking will be based on order of pre-registration um, but if you in the, uh, if you want to watch uh, I, I would say the um, hearings have been very well organized um, they they move along pretty quickly none so far have needed the, th the entire three hours um, to, um, that had been scheduled to um, provide everyone who wants to speak with the opportunity to do so. So I will close there and take any questions. Um, my contact information is here. Uh, and again, the reminder of some of the important websites. Great. Thank you so much, Mark, for covering such a broad and important uh, process and document uh, in a very short time. And uh, just to preempt uh, one question that we've already answered is that uh, Mark will make his slides available. So if you'd like to go back through and look in more detail and click some of those links, uh, we'll be sending that out as a PDF after the presentation. So uh, thank you so much, Mark, again. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and I see that there was a question here about the, um, how the how the public comment period process is going so far uh what kind of volume of comments are you receiving how has the engagement been with communities and are you getting um are you able to reach some of the communities that will be most impacted by climate change through this process well there is i think um to answer that fully understand that there is a separate requirement of the law um that i didn't take the time to go into. Um, but the, in addition to creating a Climate Action Council, the law also creates a climate justice working group um, separate from the council, not subsidiary to it. But the role of the climate justice working group is to um, to um, uh, define the criteria by which disadvantaged communities will be identified. And that's important because the law requires that 35 with a goal of 40% of the clean energy investments made um, to implement this law benefit um, disadvantaged communities. Um, and so the Climate Justice Working Group has released its draft criteria. And you can, um, if you go to climate.ny.gov, you can navigate to the page that has that information. It describes the process, the 45 or so criteria that are being um, presented as draft criteria, as well as the list of communities and a map of those communities um, that are, uh, according to the draft criteria, um, identified as disadvantaged communities. Um, the, the climate justice working group in terms of outreach was mostly made up of environmental justice advocates. Um, so there was certainly input on that. Uh, there is a separate um, process for commenting on those disadvantaged community criteria. Um, that's going now. The, the system is up to take public comment on those um, criteria and the um, um, there will be six public hearings uh, on those criteria scheduled as well. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a comment and question that I'm just going to read. Um, it seems to me that both in terms of understanding, mitigating, adapting to impacts and in prioritizing certain solutions like stream buffers, tree plantings, et cetera, 
that we would benefit from good maps of drinking water sources and their watersheds. The state lacks a comprehensive map layer of community water sources, and it's a gap in CICRA currently. Can you comment on whether and how this issue is incorporated into the scope, if at all? And if it isn't incorporated yet, can you help point to the part of the plan uh, where this person might focus on those comments? Sure. <clears throat> I don't believe that that recommendation is taken up specifically in the draft scoping plan so that I would encourage uh, you to go to climate.my.gov and go to the online form and you can click the chapter that you're making comments on uh, the topic and that would be a good one to go into the adaptation and resilience recommendations. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as, as the plan is being implemented, how will greenhouse gas monitoring be handled? And will monitoring include direct greenhouse gas impacts uh, as well as indirect impacts? We don't typically, with the exception of large sources, um, large air emission sources, we don't do um, direct monitoring because green, um, most greenhouse gases um, are well mixed in the atmosphere. Um, and so, uh, you know, understanding, you, you can't just stick a meter up in the air and measure CO2. Well, you can measure CO2, but you don't know where that CO2 came from. You know, within a day or two, um, CO2 issued, uh, em emitted over China could be, um, that molecule could be sitting over New York State. Uh, and so to understand our contribution to atmospheric uh, emissions, we will we do a, a greenhouse gas inventory and one of the law, the aspect of the law requires DEC to do an annual greenhouse gas emissions report. And we have done that um, based on the 2019 data and that will be updated. Um, that is mostly done through protocols that look at um, uh, how, fossil fuels, how much fossil fuels are being combusted and in what circumstances um, and how much electricity um, we are using. Uh, and, you know, there are estimates associated with, you know, what are the emissions associated with each megawatt of electricity that is used in, in the state. Um, and so, again, these, these, this is done using a, what we would call a top-down inventory. It is not um, even what, um, based on an amalgam of all the bottom-up inventories that might be done at the municipal level, but it's just a matter of being able to make reasonable estimates based on the, um, <clears throat> based on the um, fuel and electricity use primarily. I'll also note that we do not, our inventory does not count um, what the technically minded might refer to as scope three emissions, the emissions that are embedded uh, in the stuff that we buy and consume and throw away. Um, and to a certain extent, those emissions are exported to the places where they're manufactured um, with the exception of upstream emissions associated with fossil fuels. Um, we are required by the law to account for um, fossil uh, for greenhouse gas emissions and for the most part that's methane associated with the extraction and transmission of natural gas and oil that we combust in New York State um, and um, that's important because if you look at previous estimates of the state's greenhouse gases uh, you'll see that um, they are now estimated uh, uh, at being considerably higher than we had accounted, uh, than our accounting had shown before. And that's because we are now required to uh, account for those upstream emissions and also to use a 20 year global warming potential for refrigerants rather than a 100 year global warming potential. And if someone wants a a primer on what all that means. I'm. We can get some of our technical staff to spend a few hours with you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so there's a question here about the funding that Division of Water is looking into related to AR seven. Uh, I'm not sure what that. I don't. I don't know. What, not sure what the context is. Funding the division. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I mentioned. Uh, yeah, I do know that. I did bring that up. Um, so I, the, the, I've been working with the floodplain section, and this is related primarily to our implementation of the Community Risk and Resiliency Act, um, and. Um, 
are uh, trying to um, develop map products that would help us better implement the requirements of that law. And so we did apply for FEMA BRIC funding um, last year. We were not successful, um, but we do think we may have another source of funds uh, from another FEMA pot uh, potentially available. And we are working up a proposal to apply for that. So we don't have anything available yet, but we are um, looking for, you know, trying to get those resources um, to improve mapping. And, you know, we are doing in New York what FEMA hasn't managed to do and no other state has done, which is to incorporate consideration of future conditions, whether it's sea level rise or even more difficult, um, the effect of uh, uh, um, more extreme flooding due to more extreme precipitation events. No one has incorporated that into regulatory mapping anywhere. Uh, and so, you know, part of the problem, part of the challenge we face is being the first to try to do it and not having good models um, to base that work on. That's exciting, but also very challenging. Thanks for uh, talking a little bit more about that detail. Um, another question was about funding. If, if there's funding available for improved research for new alternative energy, such as tidal or low impact hydro. Well, I mean, the law itself did not come with funding, you know, the, and there is funding that go that mostly comes from NYSERDA. NYSERDA does fund research. That is NYSERDA's reason for being, energy research and development. Um, you know, I can't speak specifically to how they are making their funding decisions or, or what's being funded, but, you know, certainly there is a process in place for New York State Um you know, there's a surcharge on your utility bill um, that goes to NYSERDA and NYSERDA uses part of that to, to research and develop um, alternative sources. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, would you be able to talk about how the Office of Climate Change and Office of Environmental Justice are thinking about disadvantaged communities as a geographic consideration in relation to the potential environmental justice areas, which are also a geographic consideration uh, that were released almost 20 years ago with Commissioner Policy CP29? Uh, the layers have a lot of overlap. Does the disadvantages community, it, does that include all of the potential environmental justice areas? How should we take these two different um, mapped areas into consideration? Yeah, good question. And they are different. Uh, um, they are based on different criteria and they actually have different legal implications. Um, so environmental justice areas are defined by um, essentially minority makeup uh, and um, uh, income level. And we are required, um, you know, DEC's um, CP29, uh, the environmental justice policy, essentially requires enhanced public participation when a project is being planned for, um, uh, uh, planned within an environmental justice area would affect an environmental justice area. The term disadvantaged communities, and you will see us capitalizing that, um, and that is because it has a very specific meaning. Uh, it will you know, ascent, and these are we're going down to the census tract. So a disadvantaged community capitalized uh, pursuant to the CLCPA, defined by those 45 criteria that I mentioned, um, will be um, will be. Um, uh, will be used in our accounting for our compliance with the requirement that 35% um, of clean energy investments go to those communities. And I will also say that some programs are that aren't even um, covered by the CLCPA are adopting that as a strategy. So for instance, the Climate Smart Communities Program that I oversee will be, um, uh, has adopt, it will be adopting a goal of um, um, trying to, um, uh, prioritizing uh, expenditure of 40% of the available funds uh, for projects that uh, are in disadvantaged um, communities as defined by the Climate Justice Working Group. The main difference between those um, two designations is that in addition to the socioeconomic um, and, minor, and racial makeup criteria that are in the environmental justice area definition, under the law, the disadvantaged community criteria are to include um, uh, uh, 
measures of past environmental harms, um, which is not included in the environmental justice definition, and potential exposure to climate change effects. Uh, so that's why there are so many more. There are 45 uh, criteria in the current draft set, but I think that the group actually considered something like 200 or 250 different um, variables or criteria and eliminated some because they were not relevant. We had to eliminate a lot because there weren't sufficient data available at, the, at sufficient resolution to make them useful. Um, and there were privacy concerns in some cases. Um, but, um, you know, that those are the differences. Uh, they, they do my look at the map. And, and one of the things you can do, we've now, if you go to DEC Info Locator, um, which is on DEC's website, we've added the disadvantaged community layer to DEC Info Locator, which means you can um, compare um, the disadvantaged community locations with other things like permitted facilities or you know, what, anything else that's on that info locator, but you can also overlay the EJ areas with the disadvantaged community areas and see where there is overlap. And they do overlap a lot, although I believe my look at just a few areas um, seem to indicate that the disadvantaged communities tended to be smaller. Um, there's less area in disadvantaged community than in environmental justice communities. But that's my impression. You, I don't have numbers to back that up. And you would really have to examine the entire state to see if that holds true. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and I have a question um, myself. So this is not me reading somebody else's question. Um, but and I know that you've mentioned uh, across the presentation, um, but wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on where wastewater treatment facilities fit in, knowing that our wastewater treatment facilities are vulnerable to flooding in many cases, they're also greenhouse gas emissions for many communities. Can you speak to a little bit how some of these strategies might impact wastewater treatment, whether it's sure. from a greenhouse gas mitigation or adaptation? Sure. On the mitigation side, strategies to reduce emissions from wastewater treatment plants are included um, in the waste sector. Um, the, even though waste was not one of the six advisory panels specified uh, as required in the law, the advisory panel did convene, um, has authority, had authority to convene additional advisory panels, and it did so for waste, and that includes um, um, wastewater treatment plants. Frankly, I, I'm not all that familiar with the specific strategies that are recommended. I suspect they are heavy on um, uh, incentives for um, uh, use of anaerobic digesters to capture methane that would otherwise be emitted uh, um, and digested to, to form CO2 uh, or and, and to or to use that on site primarily for power production or something along those lines, but I don't have much specifics on those. In terms of adaptation, um, I think that those really get, um, protecting them from floods in particular, get rolled up into some of the more generic recommendations we have Regard, um, regarding flood protection and ensuring that you know, these wastewater treatment plants, the construction or significant improvements are subject to CARA review. And so DEC has responsibility to ensure that future conditions um, are considered when it issues its permits. That's great. Thanks for getting Make some context for that. It's a question I hear quite quite a bit. What, what are we going to do? And uh, hopefully we can use some strategies and, and start to implement the what's in the scoping plan. But we'll start by reviewing the scoping plan. Again, uh, go to the link that was uh, dropped in the chat. We'll send it around uh, as an email and follow up as well. Um, provide public comment on the draft scoping plan and take a look at that document. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for being our featured breakfast speaker this morning and walking us through this complex process and document and helping us navigate to some of the areas of, of interest specifically for water and watersheds. And we look forward to seeing everyone at our next month uh, breakfast lecture, which is going to be May 14th. So have a great day, everyone. For those of you who will be up in Albany making public comment, uh, thank you for your work and take care. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.